Jarred Song lived out of his van in Centerville, California, just so he could be at the water's side every breath of his life. Jarred sold his artwork out of the back of that rickety old vehicle to put food in his belly. And he couldn't have been happier, he got to surf every day. When a patch of waves got boring, he'd pack up his trusted old rust bucket and drive off to the next stretch of the country to find new adventures and waves to ride. Yare wanted waves, food, and freedom, which is precisely what he had. The Californian sun was barely out that Tuesday morning. Jard was already on the sand with his surfboard waiting to hit the water. Once it was light enough, he wasted no time to get in. And by the time the early morning swimmers, paddlers, and runners were out, Jard was riding and paddling in the distance. He greeted a few swimmers that went by. The friendly Californian vibe was exactly why Jared loved the place so much. Jard thought he might ride one or two more waves before heading back for breakfast. The early morning movement on the water had attracted a nocturnal predator. A 17-foot great white shark was stalking the dark waters beneath. Its night of hunting had been unsuccessful, forcing it to seek out prey in shallower waters. The smell of warm bodies traveled miles into the sea, leading the shark to the busy beach. Jard was farthest out at sea from all the other morning fitness enthusiasts. He was the first moving target the animal locked in on, silently moving in the current. Getting closer and closer to Jard's song. In the dim early morning light, no one noticed the fin slice through the surface occasionally. The shark was taking its time. It couldn't let another morsel escape. Or else it wouldn't eat at all today. Finally, after tracking Jard until the sun had illuminated the day entirely, it was ready to strike. The beast went as low as the sand allowed, then rocketed toward the board on the surface, using the distance from the bottom to the top to gain as much speed as possible. It struck Jared with so much force that he and his surfboard were ejected several feet into the air with a startled yell. The gray monster's body was silhouetted against the morning sky as it exited the water in a graceful arc. The surfboard, Jared, and Shark landed back into the water. The predator twisted its body to turn back toward the bewildered Jard the moment it was back in its aquatic territory. Several early beachgoers screamed and gasped at the sudden commotion. No one in the vicinity could have missed the spectacular display of pure ferocious strength. More than one kayaker started rowing toward Jared without a care for their own safety, intent on getting the endangered man out of the water. With more than one of them, they could scare the creature away. Swimmers close by streaked toward the beach, desperate to escape the torrent. But when Jared's head came up from the surf, he could barely gasp for breath before he was flung out of the water again. This time the shark's mouth snapped shut around Jared's waist, and they were projected into an arc before hitting the waves again. But this time Jared was securely in the animal's jaws. The shark dragged him down and increased the pressure on Jared's middle. The razor-sharp teeth sawed Jared cleanly in half. Jard bled out so fast that he did not even realize he was dying. One moment he was riding high, and the next he was thrown into a world of chaos, teeth, and darkness. The kayakers above had reached the spot where Jared's board floated, and they scanned around to find the surfer. But instead, they were met with bloodied crimson water and the gruesome appearance of Jared's torso that bobbed to the surface. The creature below was already heading back toward deeper waters, carrying Jared's lower half. It was going to devour its catch in peace. And so Jared Song's final notes were sung in the rising morning sun, out on the water he chased all of his 32 years on Earth. The sands of Hawaii are always with tourists, but Bindi and Kayla were not holiday-goers. They had grown up on the island of Kauai. The 11-year-olds attended the same class and spent as much time in the water as they did out of it. Today was no different. Both girls had sprinted out of school when the bell rang, only stopping to throw their school bags down at Bindi's house and grab their paddle boards. The paddle boards were a Christmas present from Bindi's father to their best friends, and they had spent the past two months thoroughly enjoying their gifts in the shallow waters. The pair and four of their little friends chose a patch of beach and set about enjoying the day in the sun. Kayla and Bindi were well into the deeper end behind the waves, racing each other. Rowing fiercely, Kayla was in the lead, with Bindi close behind her. Intent on their race, neither girl noticed the dorsal fin following them in the water. And neither did the beachgoers at first. One of the pair's classmates, following the race from the shoreline, finally realized the danger. 
The little boy hollered and waved his arms frantically to warm his friends in the line of fire and the other beachgoers. But none paid him any mind. His frantic yells were just background noise on the busy beach. It wasn't until the outline of a second shark appeared in a rising wave and was sighted by another swimmer who joined in on the urgent warning calls that beachgoers finally caught on. Suddenly, the shore became alive with screams and people running from the water, desperately pushing each other aside to make it to the sand. The sudden commotion and noise were so intense that Kayla and Bindi stopped their furious rowing to find the source of the panic. Kayla immediately understood the implications. You only grew up on the Hawaiian Islands after knowing about the dangers of the ocean. Instinct kicked in, and she made for the beach as fast as she could. Bindi, however, was still trying to make sense of the uproar and her friend's sudden beeline for the sand. Before the realization could kick in, the fin following her slammed into her paddleboard. The twelve-foot tiger shark rammed into her so hard that she went careening into the water, closer to the second even more, enormous tiger shark riding the wave just moments before. The larger predator turned its body sharply and launched at the live missile that crashed into the water just inches from it. Bindi's left arm was engulfed in the 14-footer's massive jaws. Her tiny frame could not withstand the force. Her limb was bitten clean off. She had no sense of the world, no context for what was happening. Her world was a submerged mess of pain and water and violent thrashing. There was no way to fight off her attacker, even less so when the tiger shark that had knocked her off her board pounced on her too. The eleven-year-old never stood a chance. The beasts ripped at Bindi, tearing away at every piece of flesh they could sink their teeth into. It took the pair of predators just seconds to render her lifeless. The onslaught continued. The sharks dove in and out of the water, filling themselves with every morsel they could. The crowd looked on, horrified and helpless to do anything to save the girl that was already long gone. Kayla only looked back when she reached the sand. She assumed Bindi was behind her all this time. But when her feet hit the beach and she turned to look for her friend, Kayla was horrified to see the gruesome red splashes among the two frantically feeding bodies in the distance. Kayla and the beachgoers stood, staring aghast at the massacre before them. When the Coast Guards finally got to the scene and the sharks fled from the sound of their engines, only scraps of Bindi were left to collect. Her remains would be returned to her family in an impossibly small box, and Kayla would speak at her best friend's funeral. She was buried with her broken paddleboard, and Kayla's whole board would never touch the water again. The small island of Jolo was in peak season. Tourists across the Philippine Islands were streaming in, and Kiam Abalos was a busy man during this time. His days were booked full. Every morning he started the motor of his banca, a traditional Filipino boat, to take visitors on relaxing cruises of the crystal clear water. Kiam saved up for years by taking people out on a small rickety motorized boat. But this year, after 10 years of squirreling away, Kiam was the proud owner of his own banca. And the purchase couldn't have been made better. Jolo was booming with tourists this year and Kiam had not had a day off for a month straight. His clients booked well in advance through a traveling agency, so Kiam only met who he was taking out onto the water for the first time when they met up at the docking station the morning of their booking. Today it was a group of eight. They were all college students, and Kiam could tell they would be a rowdy bunch. The four young women and four men showed up with coolers packed with drinks and were in high spirits. And by the time the first hour on the water had gone by, Kiam was sufficiently annoyed. The students had no interest in seeing the sights or appreciating their surroundings. They were loud, obnoxious, and prone to dangerous behavior. More than once, Kiam had to cut out his engines when one of them decided to suddenly jump off the boat with no warning. To make matters worse, they had booked Kiam and his vessel out for the whole day, and Kiam was dreading the hours ahead. And so the day dragged on. By noon, the lot was quite intoxicated. Kiam led them to a secluded bay renowned for its bright blue waters. You could see every fish and sea urchin clearly, and with the bright sun it was the ideal day to view the ocean life at the bottom of the relatively shallow enclave. Kiam hoped the quieter surroundings would lull the group somewhat and it worked for the first few minutes. Even in their high spirits, the students couldn't deny the beauty of the aquatic life beneath them. Kiam breathed a little easier for a moment, but that's all it was. A small moment of respite. The gentlemen soon got bored and started poking at the smaller fish that swam to the surface. 
Kiam was just about to tell them off when a commotion broke out. A two-meter tiger shark appeared from the cracks of some underwater boulders nearby. Though it was probably just a curious passerby, the young men decided in their drunken bravado that the animal must be scared away. They started throwing bottles and cans into the water to chase the beast back out to sea. Kian moved forward, absolutely furious. But before he could get the men settled down again, one toppled over the railing and landed right on top of the bewildered shark. Unsurprisingly, the confused beast twisted its body and snapped at the sudden intruder, taking a sizable chunk out of the man's left arm. Kian was the only one who noticed two other tiger sharks around the same size darting from the rocky outcrop. Now the drunken man was really in trouble. Kian reacted impulsively. He pushed the screaming group roughly aside and leaped into the water. His head surfaced before the two new predators had made it to the scene of the thrashing man and the shark. Kian grabbed the man and pushed him toward the banka, where his friends immediately grabbed his wrists and started pulling him up. This was enough time for the other tiger sharks to reach their companion and they fell upon Kian in a frenzied attack. He could feel teeth piercing every inch of his body and all he could do was punch and kick, hoping to land enough strikes to deter them. But he was outnumbered three to one. Kian couldn't possibly fight them off alone. The water turned into a crimson nightmare of snapping jaws. Kion's flesh was being ripped right off the bone. Amidst Kion's fight for survival, the men above tended to their friend. The three women realized what the bloody splashes and screams meant. One of them could reach out far enough to grab the struggling man's arm together, and the girls pulled him in. The beasts continued to tear at Kion's legs even as they lifted him onto the boat. One of the animals jumped out of the water as Kion was lifted out and managed to grab hold of his right foot, ripping it clean off leaving only the tendrils of torn muscle and shattered bones behind. Between the girls, they padded Kion's torn legs and ripped abdomen to staunch the bleeding. One of the women was capable enough to steer the boat back inland. By the time they stopped at a crowded beach, Kian had lost consciousness from blood loss. He was not aware of the ambulance, paramedics, or the crowds that had gathered. And when he finally woke, Kian was out of surgery and missing both legs, the damage was so significant that medical personnel couldn't save the limbs from the onslaught they received. Just because Kion had survived the immense amount of blood lost was a miracle. The man Kion had saved had long since been released with only 12 stitches to his arm. The group had left some flowers beside his bed, but he never saw them again after that horrendous day. It took a year of healing before Kion could finally sail his banka again, this time as a double amputee. He still rides along the island of Jolo to this day, but now he makes his own bookings, preferring to keep to an older clientele. Kian also has a no-drinking policy. Kian's boat, Kian's rules after all, 